Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Photographers Inside the Photographer's Mind. I'm your host, Dan Jin. Today, I'm joined by New York-based street photographer Derek Fashbender, aka Like a Machine. We're going to be talking about his newest photo book, which is just released, 2020. We're going to find out what it was like putting it together, what his doubts were, how he feels about the book, and how it was received by the general public. We'll, of course, be talking all things street photography, his relationship with Fujifilm, and whatever comes up in between. Guys, if you are enjoying the podcast, then please do support the photographer. We'd really appreciate it. If you're watching on YouTube, hit a subscribe, hit a like, ring the bell, give us a comment, whatever you want to say. You know, we want to hear it. We want to listen to it. If you're listening to it on any of the streams, Spotify, Apple, Google, then subscribe to the podcast and we can keep bringing you this content to you on a weekly basis. Right, let's get into the conversation with Derek. Derek, how are you doing? Damn, what's going on, man? <laughs> I'm all right. I'm just... chilling, hanging out. <laughs> I've been chilling, to say the least. I've been locked in a room for for the best part of uh, two weeks with the COVID. Uh, how you feeling? Doesn't doesn't sound good, dude. Honestly, two weeks locked down. I've, I've had it before. This is the second time I've had COVID, and the first time I was oh like, "There's there's no problems here." Like, but this time. There's been problems, and that's why we haven't, just for anyone who's watching or listening, that's why we haven't done a show for a couple of weeks, because I've been, uh, whilst it was, you know, overall okay, I, uh, I've i been getting better in bed, getting over the old COVID, but uh, I'm back. It's forced the rest. Yeah. <laughs> it takes you takes you out. Like you have nothing else to do but relax, so. And what a great guest to have as well um, on the return show. Derek, I am, I am. Very honoured that you agreed to sit and, and have a chat with me. What's been going on with you? What's what's going on in the world of photography for you? Oh man, it's busy as usual. I'm I'm actually I'm on like a forced rest too. Okay. If I have to go out and take another picture in the streets for the next six weeks, it, I'm I'm over it for now. <laughs> for a street photographer saying they're over it, I, I think I need a new city, man. Really? I need, like I need to get out. I, yeah, I need to travel a little bit. You know, you just hit like a breaking point. You get tapped out a little bit with seeing the same things over and over. Yeah. I think while I was while I was, you know, working on the twenty twenty thing and putting the book together, I hit a point where it's like once I finish the book, mm-hmm. it's like, okay, I don't have to take a picture for a while. Let me let me just enjoy the fruits of my labor and that's kinda of what I've been doing. I've been laying low for a little bit. I mean, we will get into the book, but I wanna I wanna I guess what you're describing right now is a creative rut, maybe. Yeah, lost a little bit of that fire. How, yeah, a little bit of the burnout. How, how do you? I mean, how do you, how do you feel when that happens? Like, do you do you panic and like, oh, what if I don't want to ever do this again? Or is it something? Is it a situation you found yourself in before? What? Well, how's 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 it feeling? You know, I I used to, and I used to hate the burnout, and I would say, okay, I'm gonna relax. I'm not gonna put any pressure on myself. And then I, I can't even think of who it was. It was a photographer that told me, shoot yourself out of the rut. Interesting. And it's like, wait, but hold on. If I'm burnt out from shooting, I don't, the last thing I want to go out there, shoot yourself out <laughs> yeah. of the rut. And I'm like, okay, bring a camera out everywhere. And that's when I, I started to piece it together. That it's like, I wasn't really burnt out from shooting. I was burnt out from the pressure I was putting on myself to make new work mm-hmm. and to put together projects. And I still enjoyed going out and capturing things. And I found that the times that I wouldn't go out with the camera, all I was doing was beating myself up because I didn't have a camera. I was like, damn, I wish I brought my camera. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in, enjoying a little bit of the rest, but, um, you know, it's, it's all mental, man. It's, it's a mental game. It's like, you're constantly going back and forth, trying to convince yourself, uh, you know, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to go out and do this. I'm, you know, I'm going to go out and not put pressure on myself to take pictures, but I have my camera here if I see something. So are you, are you filling that time with something completely unrelated to any type of photography? Or are you doing some other genres at home in the house? You got you got a family, right? Is are they kind of having to sit in front of your lens a lot or are you just completely taking away a step back completely? Yeah, I mean, I I work. I work with B&H. I do web content for for B&H, so it's like my whole life is photography. Obviously, you know, I have my son, I have my family, and it takes me away from it a little bit. I also, I'm, I'm a member of a run club, so shout out to Dykeman Run Club <laughs> here in uh, Uptown New York. But that's great. I mean, running's been been great for me just as far as 
overall health, mm-hmm. mental health, getting away from running, but everywhere else are getting away from running. See, look at I'm running from <laughs> getting away from photography. <laughs> but uh, you are literally you know, running away from it. I guess it's just... <laughs> I'm literally, literally running away from. I've had to convince convince myself not to bring a camera on my runs. It's like <laughs> I get, let me just do one thing without a camera attached to me. Hey, do you ever have? Because you know I shoot street photography as well, and I, I seem to have this like this little moment before I leave the house. Like I look at my camera and I'm like, I just have this like, it's kind of like OCD, if you will, where I'm like, I'll leave it. No, I'll leave it. No, I'll take it. And I sometimes like leave the house, shut the door, open it back up, walk back in. And I have this kind of like <laughs> little wrestle with my mind. I, do, do you ever have the same thing when you're kind of considering every, <laughs> leaving it at home? Every day, yeah. man. Every day. It's like, and then it's like, which camera? <laughs> you know, it's like, am I going to bring this one? Then we get into lenses. Dan, you know how it is, man. It's like, it's that like, okay, let me decide first if I'm going to bring it. Yeah. And then you do that, like the slow walk to the door and you're like, <laughs> all right. And then you go back and you get it. And then it's like, wait, but maybe I don't want to bring this one. Maybe, I, And then it's a lens. So for me, it's like a three faceted. It's like, am I going to actually bring the camera? Which camera am I going to bring? Which lens? And then half the time it's like, you know what? I can't decide. So I'm just going to bring like four different prime lenses. So if there's any of Derek's friends listening to this and you've always been wondering why he's half an hour late for your plans, now you know. It's <laughs> pretty much it. Uh, uh, I was really on time before I you know, got wrapped up in the actual decision of what I was going to bring when I left yeah. the house. So the book, 2020. Yeah, man. It's It is, was... Uh, I said I wasn't going to do it, and I really, really, really was like, everybody's going to do a 2020 book. I have uh, Mark Seliger's 2020 book, and, you know, it's like, I didn't want to be another, just another cliche 2020 book. We all went through it, and I really, truly did it for me, man. I just wanted to have, like, it's kind of just my photography in general. Mm -hmm. I take photos because I love the idea of keeping a journal. Mm -hmm but I'm too lazy to write. Okay. So it's easier to take pictures. And that's kind of kind of why I decided to put the images together. You know, I also didn't realize over the last year and a half how many people really 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 locked themselves down and were completely disconnected from the world at large. Mm-hmm. Like I was out there 3 4 days a week. So for me it's it was kind of like in a way the, it, like the last year and a half wasn't that much different because I was still out there. I was still going in the routine. I was still on the train. Mm-hmm. So it was like, you know, I didn't realize how many people were like, oh my God, I haven't been on a train in, you know, 16 months. And I'm like, wow. So it's, it's also for those people, you know, I'm, I'm realizing that, you know, I, I initially a decision where I decided to do it was ultimately because of me. It was a selfish decision, mm-hmm. but then I'm like, this is it's almost like a historical document here for everybody who wasn't in New York or even the people who lived in New York and didn't go outside that they can look through this and see exactly what the city looked like from the outside looking in. You know, it's, you, you make a good point, Howard, that, that there is a lot of photographers that are documenting or that did document and then are turning into to a book, um, the events of 2020, because let's face it, you know, hopefully we'll never have to experience something like this again in our lifetime, in any lifetime, but you know, from a selfish point of view, ours, what, what was kind of, so you said you wrestled with the idea of doing it. How, once you made the decision to commit to it, what was your kind of thought process of saying, I'm going to put my own stamp on this. I'm going to ensure that yes, there'll be other 2020 books of similar, similar theme, but I, what did you do to ensure that it, it was yours and only yours and, and not kind of mimicking or cliching, if, if you will? Yeah, so you hit the nail on the head, that whole cl- idea of the cliche of not wanting it to just be, I didn't want it to be, I wanted it to be genuine, man. I wanted it to be not just, hey, here's tourist locations with no people. You know, I didn't want to show an unfair view. It's so easy as photographers to we can tell any story we want, right? Like I can go anywhere in New York city and find an empty street. I just got to wait for the right time. Yeah. So I didn't want it to be like this gloom and doom. There is nobody on the streets. Now there were times when it was eerie, like you're walking around at like 8 PM in New York city. And there were times I walked around for an hour, hour and a half and didn't see a single person like right in the height of the pandemic. It was like freaky. Yeah. 
but I, I can go in certain areas of the city anytime non-pandemic and see no people yeah so i wanted it to be i wanted it to be real if there's a person there's certain images where it's like okay 5 10 15 people it wasn't about just like this bare naked empty city that looks like will smith and i am legend or everybody wearing <laughs> hazmat suits and you know i didn't want to like ham it up i think so much of what we see now content wise like you look at TV and everything is like played up. Yep. Nothing's really, really, really real. And I wanted this to be real. So you do see some of that. You see, I think it's important to show the landmark places because tourism has been dead, man. Even now that we're getting back, tourism still for the most part is pretty much dead compared to what it normally is. Yeah, I can imagine. So I wanted to show those tourist locations like 42nd Street with just a couple people, you just had you know, a couple homeless people scattered down 42nd street. It was just wild to see. Um, and you know, people in the height where we didn't know if like the world was going to end or not, you had like hazmat suits everywhere and office buildings being cleaned out by these cleaning crews. And it looked like the, uh, it was the movie with Tommy Lee Jones and the little monkey, uh, um, no idea. Outbreak outbreak. <laughs> there we go. I think it was that. So it was like, you know, it, it was a mix of showing that side of things, but not really getting carried away. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I wanted it to be real. I wanted it to be genuine. I think that's what my ultimate putting my stamp on it was. And because I couldn't even put my real stamp of having it very people centric, you know, my work has always been driven by people. Yeah. And now you take people out of the equation and I was forced to look at other aspects of the city. You know, I shot a lot more architecture. It was very, disconnected from how I normally shoot. How, how did it impact your enjoyment of shooting street photography? Because like you say, it's a completely different environment um, in the in, in the middle of the pandemic with, with so many uh, fewer people on the streets. Like you say, you turn to architecture and things like that, but in terms of like in the moment enjoyment, how did, how did the working in the pandemic affect that? It was great. It was great to really challenge yourself to see in a new way. And, and I used it as like a constant exercise in now you don't have people. I think people can be easy to, as far as telling stories, as far as engaging content, like portraits are just interesting mm -hmm. when you don't have that aspect or when you have, you now have masks covering people's faces. Think about like when you look at pictures of people, yeah. how much expression you get from just having an uncovered face, like the, it's the most simplistic of things, but you put a piece of cloth over someone's face and you take out a lot of the expression. So for me, it was telling a story, you know, and, and going back to the previous question, you know, telling a story, a, a, you know, how do you get this story out? How do you tell it? Well, Hey, how do you know this is in the middle of, you know, a pandemic and it's not just 4am in New York. Yeah. You know, so telling, telling the entire story, but without being able to, to do it with people because really you didn't get people even the people you did see nobody was coming within 10 feet of you yeah it's crazy it's a cra and, uh, it's wild uh, man so some uh, i just because i know people who i saw someone someone in the photo industry i can't remember who but they, they put a message out like a week ago saying first time in a restaurant in 18 months which blew my mind because i personally speaking i was as soon as i was in columbia at the time and as soon as the government was like go where you want i was like i'm out of here i'm i'm out in the open i'll, <laughs> I'll you know i'll do whatever but I, how was it in new york was was the mandatory lockdowns like what, what how t t talk to me about your decision to kind of keep going out there and, and creating photographs when other people were you know hibernating at home oh it, it was wild i i had to not only you know i'll be honest with you i wasn't I wasn't concerned and I know there's a lot of people out there that might judge and it's like, well, it's not about you. It's about other people. And it's like, I wasn't seeing family. I wasn't visiting people. I had my family here and, and obviously my family was okay with my decision to go out. My wife understood that I had to go out and this is something that I felt I had to do. Yeah. You know, I had to document this and my four year old son, it's like, it's, it's something that in, in my research with my best judgment, I didn't feel like I was was a risk to them, but explaining this to other people and catching flack from other people. And it's like, for everybody, it's like, you know, the, the 10% of people that are like, oh, that's cool. You're going out and documenting this. 
the 90% were like, you're crazy. What are you doing? You shouldn't be out there. You're a danger to others. And you just, you got to tune out that noise yeah. at a certain point because it, it, there's a lot of people that are putting themselves in predicaments to document. And it's, it's not, you're not going out for a thrill kill. Mm -hmm. You're going out and, and truly it comes down to what my, what was my intention in going out there? My intention wasn't going out there to shoot some, you know, some content that is just trying to get likes, just trying to get follows, trying to go viral. I wasn't submitting my work to, to any media or press. It wasn't about getting me out there. It simply was a record of historic documentation, which I think is, I mean, Dan, that's like one of the most important things about having cameras now yeah. is everyone can tell their version of history and that's what I wanted to do. So I had to just really tune, tune out the noise. You know, I, I took my precautions. I stayed disconnected from people mm -hmm. and took pictures. You know, and I, I think in time, or at least I hope, I think, I think society will be more grateful for those that kind of did. I don't want to say go against the grain because, you know, it's like, like you say, it's not like, and I think people get this misconstrued. If you go out and make photos during a po pandemic, it doesn't mean that you're going out coughing over people or just like, you know, not having a care in the world. You can, you can go outside if you're allowed to go outside and, and still be mindful of your fellow person on the street. So, so I think, I, th I think that's a misconception, but also I think, you know, the more we know about, everyone's an expert on COVID, aren't they? When really none of us, most of us are. <laughs> exactly. But I think, I think we'll Facebook be, says yeah, so. yeah, exactly. But I think people will be grateful because there's a lot of things that have happened during this whole time, uh, not just COVID related, but just so many things have happened in the past year that if we didn't have photographers going out and keeping some kind of record, then, you know, who knows? Not, I, you know, I'm not being a conspiracy theorist, but who knows? Society could get away from us. We, we need people to go out and hold what's happening on the streets, in the world, accountable. And photography is one of the best, if not the best way of doing that, maybe video as well, to, to have a, a, a visual documentation of saying that's how they handled the situation. So I think it'll be a slow payoff, but I think in maybe 10, 15, 20 years, people will be like, oh, thank God we've got imagery of that. So yeah, definitely. And especially from so many different perspectives yes. where it gives you that option of kind of weeding out and saying, okay, this person clearly focused on this aspect and this person you know, had this dynamic or this, um, agenda they wanted to push, you know, but it's important to have all those, all those voices and all those visions. Yeah. And then people can make their own kind of, you know, ideas of, of what, of what they think. So in terms of the book the the, the is it, so it's 240 pages, right? 240 pages. It's, uh, I did a short written forward mm -hmm. and it's just photos, just photos. And I, and I think leaning back to what we were just saying, it's, I, I wanted people to be able to just look through, have a visual representation of what the city looked like. I didn't want to try to push my opinions, my views on anyone. I really just want people to look at the images, yep. enjoy them. You know, and I, I know that might be kind of a morbid thing to say, enjoy these images of such a horrible time, but it was, it's, you know, at a certain clip, photography is aesthetic. There's an aesthetic yep. to it. And, and there, it, there was something that was solemnly beautiful about seeing a city that is known for its vibrance in life really just on its knees. Mm -hmm. So, no. How did you, I imagine you didn't publish every photo that you made. Talk to, talk to us about the kind of the process of getting it down to the final set of images where you were like, yep, it's ready to go. Let's put it out there. What was that like? That That's the most miserable <laughs> part of putting the book together. It's like, there's so many images and it's like, how do you choose? And then you have to pair them. And anybody who's done a book or put a collection of images together will say, Hey, it's worth the money to invest in a curator mm. that looks through all your images, picks out pairings. And I, I agree there, there are people that do that and it's worth the money. But for me, I'm such a control freak. Okay. Like I need the control. I need to know like what images are going in. There's certain things that you know, it's like with movies, I've always been fascinated with Easter eggs and movies, that hidden thing that like, oh, wow, did you know that this movie, this guy, you know, the director's actually in it or, yeah. you know, stuff like that. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff that are, that's in my book that you may not catch 
or you may not pick up. And I, it's just all my images. So some of the pairings you might, you know, be wondering, well, why are these two images together? Yeah. And I know why they're put together <laughs> and it's not explained, but it's like, that's one of the things why I needed full control, but it's so hard to choose because we all have images that we are personally in love with, especially something so uh, you're so emotionally attached to a project like this. Yeah. So trying to disconnect between, does this need to be in the book? What relevance does it serve? Where does it fit into the entire story? Or is it just something that I have a personal connection to and it really doesn't deserve to be in here? So it's the most miserable part putting that, you know, especially when you leave images out and you're like, ah, I don't want to leave this out, but it doesn't really fit in. So that, that, that's a, an interesting point. And how, how did you come overcome like, so yeah, there will, will have been points where you're like, that needs to be in, but how, how did you find the balance between how you wanted the book to look and how you feel people may receive it in a better way? How did you kind of like put your own wants and needs to one side and try and think about what would the consumer want? Or was it completely from start to finish? This is how I want it to be. People either like it or they don't. Totally, totally. There's a lot of stuff that would have been easy to put in because it's more like that clickbait variety of you know, I, I took a million pictures of Chrysler Building, Empire State Building, Union Square, stuff that was just visually, you know, I, I had, I think, like five or six images from Union Square Park right. that were visually stunning. And some of them had like, you were nighttime shots where the park is empty and you just have a silhouette of, of somebody and it's up against the, the white of the, the arch there. And it looked just visually arresting. Yeah. But I already had an image from Union Square and it's like, I don't need to, I don't need to make this a New York tourist trap, only the big locations. I really, it really was about my vision, which was keeping, you know, showing all facets of the neighborhoods that I saw. And some of the images are just, you know, a reflection of somebody up against an iron gate that was closed. Mm -hmm. And I love the colors and I love the, the shadow up against the gate and it doesn't really say much in the grand scheme of things but to me you know it had to be on brand yeah and my 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 branding is different than the postcard portrayal of new york city a lot of what i shoot in the city is very gritty very blue collar the the corners of the city that nobody really looks to got you and i, I want to know what the feeling was like so you, you've done the book and and the, the moment it goes out for release are you kind of like panicking, like, what if no one wants it? What if it gets like, what, what's that feeling like <laughs> before you get the first kind of, you know, purchase or, 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 or good review or whatever? What, what's that in between feeling like? It's, you know, the, the feeling of actually completing something was like, it overrode everything. It was like, it was so nice to complete something to, to not have this lingering. Cause I, I feel like this is kind of something time was of the essence. So you can't put out a 2020 book in 2030. It doesn't have the same impact. So I rode that feeling of completion through and I kind of, you know, you never really, it, I, I self-published it and self-publishing is so damn expensive. As you know, it's like, it's one of those things where if anybody's out there thinking that a book is, is like a gold mine and you do a book to, to get famous and make money, it's like, no, you, you don't yeah. even, even if you have a publisher and you have a name and somebody comes to you and says, we want to publish this. It's not like you see on TV where you're signing a $10 million book deal to, uh, you know, some major publishing house. And there's, you know, you don't have to put your neck on the line to make sure that enough copies get sold or buying back stock or anything like that. Yeah. So I tried to, I, I didn't even like I discounted that. It's, I didn't expect anybody to buy it. I expected everybody to be like, oh, that's great. I want to support you. Oh, wow. That's expensive. Oh, I'm not paying that. Um, you know, so I tell people all the time, it's like, it's great for people to support, yeah. but you know, just getting the word out. It's, it's really, you know, again, I keep saying this, but it's so true, Dan, that I did it for me. I did it for my record. Mm -hmm. I think anybody who, anybody who does buy the book is getting a piece of history mm -hmm. and it, they're getting a nicely curated book that's going to only get better and only mean more with time. I mean, who knows where we're going to be 30, 40 years from now. Yeah. So that alone, it's like, I, I kind of, I kind of went into the, the release part with zero expectations for, for something. And, you know, I'm, I'm actually taking all the profits from it 
and I've always wanted to give away a camera a year. Okay. Now there's a lot of people that are passionate about photography. I love, I love the power that photography has. So I set a goal for myself and I'm like, look, this will be a great start. Take whatever profits I make from this, put it to a new camera to, to upgrade somebody or give somebody else the power of storytelling because while the gear doesn't matter, the gear matters. You know, you gotta have a nice storytelling tool. And so I, I hit my I hit my goal, let's say. In the first couple of days I hit my goal of where I wanted to be for being able to provide somebody a camera. So that right there, everything else is just the icing on the cake. That's amazing, man. You're a better man than I. I put all my profits into a five day binge drinking bender and <laughs> <laughs> just invite me invite me just one day I'd, i just need one day i'd walk man. past the small child asking for a camera i'd be like no i want champagne it's not so you're a better man than i that's that, that's good stuff now and i you know i think you are right the, the camera does matter i think something that the cliche is it's just a tool and that, that there's certain elements to that but you have to enjoy yeah the camera that you're that you're holding you have to have some kind of 100 connection to it whatever the reason is to connect to a certain brand you know whether it's like a sony fujifilm you know it's whatever your reason is it, it does matter and obviously you shoot fujifilm totally. uh, as as do i yes. and so yeah i guess that, that's a perfect segue into to why fujifilm what, what what is it about fujifilm that what, what what's your reason for for using their cameras and, and what does it do for you in terms of kind of inspiring you and allowing you to do what you do out on the streets you know it's it's really just about having a simple camera set up beautiful beautiful colors that for me you know I, i've always loved film and not for like the hipster reasons where it's like oh god film yeah, yeah it looks cool it's like you see like a you see this crappy photo and it's like yeah but i shot it on 35 millimeter it's like Okay, it's still a crappy photo. <laughs> um, you know, I love the aesthetic. It's like the the film aesthetic. There is there's a beauty to it. There's a romance to the process, and I think Fujifilm captures best that essence. Beautiful colors. It's a nice tactile experience with manual. You know, the manual functions. For me, you know, you hit the nail on the head when you said you have to have a camera that you want to use. Mm -hmm. What what gets you excited about shooting? Yeah. I remember the first time I shot with the Fujifilm camera and it was like, you know, it was the X pro and I'm like, Oh my God, this is amazing. How have I never, you know, all the, my one friend that had, he's been trying to put me onto Fujifilm for a couple of years before this point. And he, he's like, see, see, cause I hit him up and I'm like, dude, Oh my God, like this, <laughs> this is great. You know, and I, I've been going around t doing street photography with a DSLR. I'm like, what the hell was I thinking, man? Why didn't somebody introduce me sooner? It's so true. I had, um, you know, maybe quite some time ago, I, I went with the ridiculous mantra that bigger camera, bigger sensor, bigger, better photos, right? And I used to use the Nikon D610, which by the way, I, I still have a, I don't have the camera anymore, but I still have a soft spot for it. I love that camera. And then someone let me use their Fujifilm X-T10, I think it was back then. And that was it. I was like, oh, I, I need one. Of, I, I need one of these. It's like just, it was just to, to, to produce that image quality like you say the colors are great it doesn't even matter that it's a crop sensor you know i'm not doing big ad campaigns or anything like that it's like yeah. for what i'm doing it's like it was just perfect and i was like i can make the photos i want with a either without with a camera like what this this big instead of like this big and you know i don't have the biggest hands either far from it um the probably remnant more it's a no brainer yeah so it's, it's great and now i'm on the xt2 <laughs> So how did your relationship with Fujifilm come about? Because like you say, you, you, you're a creator and ambassador with them now. How, how did that relationship come about? You know, it's funny. I, I did a workshop with them before I even got really involved in the Fujifilm world. And, it, you know, they were doing a Photo Plus Expo in New York yeah. and they were doing these street photography workshops. And a buddy of mine who was like, hey, why don't you send your information into them? Your work is great and you know send them your website see what they think i got in touch with somebody from fujifilm i think it was like two days later and uh stacy from the fujifilm team if you're out there watching listening all goes back to that moment stacy was just awesome like Shout everybody everybody from fujifilm has has been just incredible and it was from the start you know when you just click with somebody and you're like wow this is like a brand i would totally totally love to work with and i've never been i've never like that's never been on my radar i've never wanted to be a influencer a brand ambassador anything like that mm -hmm. and even now being a brand ambassador it's like it's still not 
It doesn't make me who I am. Yeah. I'm still Derek Fosbender, the photographer. I just happen to be a Fujifilm ambassador. And uh, did that workshop with them. And I love people, man. I love teaching people about my process, how I do what I do. I like to think of it as less teaching people or educating people, but really just opening up people's minds. You know, Don't show people how to use their camera. Don't show them what settings to use. Don't try to be overbearing on their process. Show them how I do my thing. Look at how they do their thing. Okay, you have a different style than me. Maybe this would work. Why don't you try this? Or hey, you're uncomfortable doing this. Why don't you go over there and, tr and try this? And that was kind of it. You know, we, we developed a relationship that, you know, started to grow and I clearly got along with them. They got along with me and then they introduced a new ambassador program that is unrivaled. If you ask me in, in the industry, it's an actual like transparent process for how to become an ambassador. So yeah. I applied and, uh, and got accepted, but it's, you know, it's great what they're doing because that's always been a mystery in the industries. How do I become a brand ambassador? Yeah. And they stripped away all that mystery and was like, Hey, you want to become a brand ambassador for us? This is where it starts. And you can apply to collaborate with us. You can apply to be a creator and such and so forth. So it's been, it's been a lovely relationship. I, I know you say it doesn't define you and, and nor should it, but was there a little part of you once it became official that was that? Did it give you a little bit of a confidence boost? Like, you know, food you put Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't running around my apartment like, yes! <laughs> you get geeked, totally. You get geeked. I mean, it's, it's, I think it, it's healthy, right? You should yeah. be able to be happy about your accomplishments. As long as it's not one of those things like, you know, sometimes you get messages and you get people who are like, well, how do I become an ambassador? And you look at their body of work and you see room for improvement in their body of work. And it's like, I get it. Like everybody starts somewhere. Like you look at my old picture and it's like, oh my God, like looks like a pack of highlighters exploded <laughs> on the page. It's horrible, you know, oversaturated and just, ugh. So I get it, but it's like, if you're at that point, you know, I'd rather be getting questions from people like, how do I make my work better? How do I make my work more impactful? Not how do I become an ambassador? Yeah. It's great when you hit that point where you've been working hard and you're rewarded for your success. But I think we've, we've become such a culture of people being obsessed with social media celebrity and likes and follows and all this, these analytics. And it's like, dude, look around Instagram. It's, it's, it's all like smoke and mirrors. Yeah. It's like 100,000 followers and 16 likes. And if you're still aiming, like if that's the lifestyle you're aiming for, you're completely missing the point. Yeah. And, and you know, you know, aside from just making better photographs, like you do, you're not, in my opinion, at least, you're not getting the most of out of what photography really can give you. Like it can give you so much more than an ego rub online. You know, it can, it can help with mental health, just, it can help with just kind of your own personal oh, yeah. identity. I, you know, I love the fact that to my friends, I'm the photography guy. That's me. That's who I am. You know, I know my place in my groups and, and I wear it with a, a badge of pride. And, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather be that than, you know, loads of people. There, there are benefits to having a good social following, especially, you know, if you're, if you're trying to market a, a, a product or something like that, let's, let's not completely um, put it down. But yeah, there's so much more you can get out of of photography than than just some likes on the internet but you know it's the world we live in now it's how they see it right i mean i look the it's the mental health aspect for me yeah in, in large part it's like this this keeps me it keeps me sane it's it's been there for me you know i i really got involved in photography when i was at my lowest point and i was right. like down and out and there was something about going out and creating that was just so beautiful to me. And it's kind of morphed in time. You know, my main, my main inspiration is looking back at, you know, four by six photos that my mother had albums of from growing up. Yeah. And it was at that point where it's like, you're looking back and you're realizing that it's like, these aren't, these aren't well taken, finely curated albums. It's literally snapshots and you got some hard flash and you have some out of focus and you have some where they're blurry. But every single one of them conjures up a memory. It conjures yeah. up that nostalgia from growing up and all those good times that went with it. And that's what's empowered me to to really take photography seriously. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, people don't realize that that as, you know, photographers, creators, whatever you want to call us, 
we are also consumers. I, I, as much as I like making a photo, I, I love looking at images, whether they're my own, someone else's. You know, I, mm-hmm. my first relationship with 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 pictures was was my uh, nana. Sim- similar to situation to you, she just had like a a random album of photos. You know, there's no she she wasn't trying to be any kind of like photographer. She was just she had a whatever camera, you know, at the beach, things like that, and just I could just spend hours just looking at images and we don't really have that anymore especially with the internet you know we just scroll and scroll we don't i, I love the a, a physical yeah i love the physical kind of aspect of 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 looking at, at, at photographs I, I just want to go back to and you can you can move on p- past this if, if if you prefer to but you said you actually really got into photography at the lowest point of of kind of a, the period of your life i mean if you're happy to do so can you kind of let us know kind of what was going on and how you got to photography to, to get out of that, that situation. Oh, definitely. I mean, I think this is one of the things that I probably get the most messages about is because I'm so open with my mental health struggles. It's like, you don't have that many people that are doing it, you know, and that are putting it out there, really putting themselves out there. Sometimes it's like, yeah, celebrity opens up about their depression. It's like, my God, I feel so bad for you and your mansion. <laughs> Beverly Hills, you're crying. Like with all your doc, it's like no, like being down and out, like you know, is losing your job. You know, I lost my job in 2008. Mind you, it was the worst job. I hated it. Okay, it was uh, working at Enterprise Rent a Car. Horrible, dude. It's like <laughs> my my brother got me a job there just so he can get like a fifteen hundred dollar hiring bonus. <laughs> and it's like great, just completely derail my life so that you can get fifteen hundred bucks. <laughs> totally cool. <Yeah>. So, <laughs> blessing in disguise. I lose my job there, but it's like, of course, it's like you know, I already moved out of my parents' house, so it's like, damn, I gotta support myself. I had, if you're ready for this, I'm ready. A Casio XLM little point and shoot from like two thousand three. Wow. It's probably like two, three megapixels. It was busted up. It was missing like three screws. So I had to like hold the case together. So when I lost my job, my mother was going out to visit family in Utah. So she's like, why don't you come out? I think it'll be good for you. Yeah. So I'm like, you know what? I'll tag along. So my mother going out, she's going out to like see her brother and her mother. And I took the trip. None of my siblings with me. None of my cousins were going to be there. It's just going to be like me hanging out with the older people. And I brought this little camera. I took pictures. And it was like, it gave me something to do on that trip. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it, you know, the pictures were probably horrible looking back at them. I probably overprocessed them to hell. <laughs> and, but it was like, it was there that I, like, it was my point that I was like, you know what? This is kind of cool. I kind of love taking images. Yeah. So, I would be out of work for almost the next two years. And I found myself going around to random places, just taking pictures. And this was a time where I couldn't turn on the TV. I was so depressed that I turned on the TV and it was like, you'd have like duck dynasty on. And it's like, Oh my God, these guys are like, these guys are millionaires and I'm sitting here and I'm like, I have nothing going on. And you turn over here and it's like, okay, pregnant teen mothers, (laughs) you know, have their own shows on HBO and they're like 13 years old and have six kids. And it's like, but they have their own TV show. And I'm like, Oh my God. I'm like, they're just, they're trolling you at this point. They're throwing everything in your face. Like you could be the biggest screw up in life and they're still more successful than you. So it's like mental health was like, boom, (laughs) crashing. And my camera really was, it was, it was the savior. And I was like, I gotta get a better camera. See, it's like something that's in, it's ingrained from you from the start. Yeah. From the start, you're even like, my gear is shit. I need to, something. To, to be fair, your your gear was shit. You needed a better camera, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was it wasn't doing the job. I've I've tried to look back at those images and I'm like, why is the image this big? And it's like, what was like what I was shooting thumbnails. Yeah. It serves its so. purpose, but yeah, if anyone needed a better camera, it was you. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely. So. That's it, man. I mean, I I got the itch there and I watched tons of tutorials and just try to make myself better. I joined a, I joined a group of photographers that was led by a guy who has actually become a good friend of mine, Frank Voronsky. And he's a long time commercial photographer. He, you know, he shot album covers, shot all these celebrities and he had started like some meetup group. That's when meetup.com was on and popping. And 
he had a little meetup group and I'd go there and I'd rub elbows with people and you know, it was it was like your typical group of like random people, retired people who had nice cameras and guys who went to model mayhem meetups with the seventy two hundred lens on a D three body and just wanted to see a half naked chick. <laughs> um so it was like your whole mix of people, but it got me in, you know, it, it got my hooks in. And that's where I started to get to the point where I wanted to take it more seriously. Yeah. And, and was it always, always street photography or was, was the same kind of experimentation with other genres? Or... <laughs> Very bad experimentation. <laughs> Very bad. Very bad, Dan. We don't want to, we don't want to dig up those skeletons. It was, you know, there, there was a friend of mine, you know, one of my probably my first mentor who actually met in that photography group. We, you know, we connected with another lady in the group and she had like a studio space. She had like this farm and she built out like a studio space in there. And it's like, now look, we had a hell of a lot of fun. We would go down there and it's like, it was like you had, you know, a, a unused space in a barn <laughs> with some alien bees and some, you know, I remember I grabbed like one of my friend's daughters wanted to model and she shows up like an hour late with a handle of vodka in the passenger seat. And I'm like, okay, like, <laughs> what am I doing with my life? But this is fun. That So I guess that kind of sums it up. I, we we got into street photography shortly after yeah, that. <laughs> I, well, I, I remember one of, well, one of my earliest experiences and I don't mind sharing this, but, um, so I, I just started out, so it was like anything I'd do, like I'd go on landscape trips. So, you know, if anyone was like, hey, make my portrait, I'd be like, yes, I'd say yes to everything. This one woman, she reaches out, she's like, hey, can you make me some um, some portraits uh, for my website? I said, yeah, okay. I was like, what what what's your, what are you like? And she's like, oh, I'm a model. I get, I, this is, I was living in London back, back, back at the time, and I, I get to this place in London, which... I, already, I should have known just by where I was going that this is probably not going to go as well <laughs> as, as, as I would hope. I get there and some big dude just greets me. And like, I, I, I'm not a big dude. Like, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm no. five foot four and I might be generous there. I'm like, I, you know, I don't know how much I weigh, but feather, feather weight. There's not even a weight class for me in UFC. Let's just say that, right? <laughs> There's no weight class for me. And there's this big dude and she, and she gets there and she's in the room. And, uh, you know, just to be very blunt, there's just an array of sex toys on the bed. And I'm like, oh, oh God. this looks dangerous. Like, uh, to be fair, we had a great time. Uh, and, you know, I've put it down to experience. No one has nor ever will see those photos from my side. Um, and she gave me a box of chocolates. But, yeah, pretty much from there, I was like, street photography it is, you know. I was the same. How sweet. A box of chocolates. Wow. box of box chocolates. chocolates. Yeah. Didn't give you like a uh, big eggplant or something? No, like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no butt plugs or anything. I was a bit disappointed leaving. Oh, <laughs> man. Horrible swag there. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's a good time. <laughs> I, I want to, so you, you go also by the uh, moniker Like a Machine. Tell me about that. What, what, what's, where, where, where did that name come from? <laughs> is, is, that, is, that, is that related kind of to like, because you do a lot of exercise and training? Is that, are you just a, a big buff machine? So you've carried it over Not to at photography? Not all. <laughs> I, was, I was listening to a Howard Stern interview and he had an adult film star on okay. by the name of Little Lupe. Okay. And she, she was talking about a certain member of her... Uh, her, her, a part of her body was like a machine <laughs> and Howard Stern goes, he's like, he, he you know, it's, like, it, it's, it's what she's like, you know, like a machine, like a slot machine to make money. And I'm cracking up like big Stern fan, always been like since watching Howard Stern on channel nine and listening to him on the radio back when, you know, before it was satellite radio. <laughs> So this was around the same time when I was like coming up with branding. So at the time is like, I had my Instagram name was like Derek Clayton photo, which is my first and middle name. Yep. And I was like, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a Derek Clayton photo. <laughs> like, no, it's not Derek Fosmander photography. Like that's totally not my brand. Like I, I can't go with that. So I was thinking of like, all right, I need a new Instagram name. That's the start of like this whole branding process is yep. getting an Instagram, na yeah, Instagram name out there that represents me. So I'm listening to this interview and I hear her say like a machine and I'm like, oh my God, that's it. So I go right to the internet and I Google like a machine. Yeah. I'm like, let me see what comes up. 
And like a machine is taken and there's like stuff that comes up. Cause you know, I, I was conscious of like SEO and all that. Like you want something that's going to stand out. Yeah. And at the time I didn't want to use, I didn't want to use my name because I'm like, no one's going to spell Fosbender correctly. So it's not going to be great for branding. Yeah. So I changed the spelling of machine, which makes it, you know, more unique, but also no one knows how to read it where half the people look at it and they're like, Lickia matching what? <laughs> and the only person there's I think maybe maybe there's two people. But I remember when I first met Ian Spanier, who's a uh, professional photographer. I was bringing him on to do a uh, to do a, a workshop for B&H. And we first, you know, we hit I hit him up, we exchanged information. I send him my Instagram name and he goes, "Holy shit, little Lupe." And I'm like, <laughs> You got it. One person knew. One person knew what it was. I didn't have to explain it. It was it was like an aha moment. It was so great. So I'm like, okay, the branding is right. I I know I've hit the mark. And but you know, I, over the years I've had multiple people ask me what it is and it's like before I tell anybody what it means, yeah. of course now I just put it out there for the for the world to to hear, but yeah. I'd I'd say, "Oh yeah, you know, like a machine, you know, like um I'm like a machine, you know, very I deliver constant results." <laughs> People like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> I love that. I I, I love that because you know what the, the the art world is like and the photography world. It's very, you know, it can be a bit. Meh. Uh, I don't know what the word. I don't know what the p polite word is. But um, yeah, I could just imagine someone be like, what, so what's like the deep artistic meaning behind your behind your name? And you're like. Howard Stern and Porno, so <laughs> <laughs> how do you like that, eh? <laughs> there we go. Wait for the re wait for the reaction. So uh, you have a, a little 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 um, little child, a little human that you created, and I, I saw on your website that you're kind of introducing them to the streets. Is that to do street photography or just uh, just to the streets yeah. in general? Like, or you're just like, hey, this is the outside world. I, <laughs> In general, I'm, he, dude, he's he's like a maven with the the MTA. Like he knows like trains, subways. I went on the he's he's on my computer the other day. He's on Google Street View, wow. going like, oh hey here hey here's those parrots on two thirty first Street. And then he's like going to his school. I'm like, you're four years old. Yeah. How do you first of all know how to navigate? Like there's there's adults that I'll give you know I'll give a friend a ride home and if they don't drive they're like I'm like how do you how do you get back to your place uh I don't know <laughs> they don't know their way around the streets and this kid's here over here on Street View navigating but you know he has an interest in photography yep. spoiled spoiled brat right he his first camera was an X Pro three oh, that's what that's what he, <laughs> he cut his uh he cut his teeth on an X Pro three and it's like I've been you know sculpting him and he loves taking pictures so it's I I hope he stays with yep. it. I always said I wasn't going to be the kind of father that is like, you got to do this. If you're not a photographer, you're not, you're not living in this house. Yeah. <laughs> but I want him to stay with it. I mean, I think it would be kind of cool to, to pass that on to him. The same way that, you know, my mother inspired me and my mother wasn't even a photographer. I mean, truth be told, my mother, half the time it was like, my, so my grandmother's name was Bean and Bean was always around for the family events. So it was always this. My mother would be like, I got my, I got my props here with no lens on it. <laughs> be, oh. Bean, do you have batteries? <laughs> okay. Puts batteries in. Oh. <laughs> Bean, do you have film? <laughs> it's like never never film, never batteries. So it's like how as many pictures as my mother has from growing up, I bet my grandmother has four times as many because she was always filling in. Nice. So it, it would be cool to pass it on to him. And that's great that he he's he seemed to warm to it as well. I mean, I honestly I don't know how and maybe I'm biased. I don't know how you could not like photography. I think, especially nowadays, you know, it's we, you know, as much as people like to complain, like, oh, everyone's making photos. I think it's great when I see people all around having some kind of interest in something I'm completely in love with and passionate about. To me, that's a great thing, you know. And and I always live by the idea that more cameras doesn't always mean more better photographers. You know, there's the, there'll still be a, a huge hill of shit you know to be blunt of you know not everyone's <laughs> going to be great at photography but you know just the fact that people are taking an interest and, and there are so many benefits to it i i love it and um you know phone cameras are getting better so it's it's just i think it's great i think it's a good thing and it's you know it's good that 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 the young one is uh 
How about how about the other half? Is is she is she into it or is it is it nah? No, <laughs> no. It's like it, I have to I have to get like a release sign <laughs> to take an image. God forbid if I want to post it. If I want to post it, it's like forget about it. I, I realize that anytime I go into that, I learned a long time ago that. You can't post without a screening process. It has, the, it has to be, you know, put for approval. Yeah. Got to submit it for approval before you post it. I mean, you can, but, but enjoy the consequences. It, like, you know. Yeah. yeah <laughs> it, it, there you go. It's like not talking for two weeks. Okay, cool. Yeah. Sign me up. Exactly. Where, do I, where do I sign? And, that, and then it's like, you know, I have a reputation around the house of not getting them pictures from. So I, I don't think I, I think I probably the last nine years of Christmases, Thanksgivings, random trips here and there, I haven't sent them the images to. So I might one day have to put a book out of all of my unreleased family photos that I never sent to my wife. Enjoy the lawsuit. Your wife takes um, you to court. <laughs> she doesn't leave you. She just sues you. <laughs> You'll get half my money, but none of the images. Yeah. <laughs> so, so where can people get the book? Go to going back to the book, where, where, where are you putting it out on your website? Is it, is it, um, yeah, yeah, I got a, I got a link on my website. Um, you can dry, buy it directly on Blurb. I did it through Blurb. Mm -hmm. Blurb. Look, great, great image quality. This is, uh, I got, this is a little small. I got an eight by 10 version, really good quality. Uh, like I said, it's, you know, it's pretty much it's just images here, but, um, nice. I did an eight by 10 version on just their standard paper option. And then I did a 13 by 11 collectors on the, the pearl paper, which is, is beautiful. But if you, if you look it up on, on blurb, if you go on my website, I do have a, a, a link there on my website as well. We'll put links uh, a bit beneath everything as well and make sure people get to it because yeah, I mean, you know, awesome. not, not to completely blow smoke up your backside, but you know, you're a fantastic photographer. I, I've, you know, I've, I've enjoyed looking at your work for quite some time now. So when I saw that you'd, you'd put a book out there, I was like, Let's get talking because I, I know that you know awesome, pe people are gonna people are gonna have something of value. It's your, your own stand on this very peculiar time in our lives, and good for you, man. I mean, you know, I think I, I say that as well. You know, you, 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 you were kind of on the fence about it. Good for you for kind of saying, you know what, let's do it and let's go with it. And from what I'm seeing online, and you know, and things like that, and just from your response to doing the book, it, it seems like a great decision. Totally. Totally. I, I, I don't regret it at all. And I actually recommend to everybody I talk to, even if you don't do a book, print your work. Yeah. You know, we talked about like image quality and, and what keeps us passionate, you know, having cameras that we're passionate about using. There's nothing like seeing your work in print. I, I try to print as much as possible. It, it's really, it, my work is made to be seen large. And I think a lot of people's is mm -hmm. your, your, your work isn't made to be seen on a one by two block on a phone screen it just it doesn't know justice there's no passion there completely agree i was in i was in a photo gallery actually the other day and i was like oh wow this is what it's this is what it's all about i was seeing these big images of volcanoes and i was like yeah there's no feeling like this that the internet you could have the biggest monitor in the world it doesn't matter seeing that print smelling it feeling it it's just uh, totally. Yeah, going to start getting a little it's bit weird here, Derek. I mean, it's going to start getting weird. If I go. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. <laughs> yeah. I got to grab the closest thing to me. Photo book porn. That's uh, that. Yeah, I'm sure that you type that on the internet. <laughs> There'll next. be a category. There'll be a category just photography. There we just go. Photo books on their bodies. <laughs> Dancing, be like, wait, Derek. Why is Derek <laughs> <and> <laughs> tell me about this site? <laughs> well, that's a great place to end. Photo book porn. Well done. It's. Uh... <laughs> Derek, I there we go. We're rolling. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to speak with me. It's uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, and uh, yeah, I'm sure everyone's going to enjoy listening to this, and uh, we will catch up soon. Awesome. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It's been a blast, man. No worries, brother. You take care. You as well, Dan. Thank you. Well, thanks again to Derek for speaking with me. If you're intrigued by his work, which I'm sure you are, then you can see links to his pages below in the description. Guys, we will be back again next week, but do remember to subscribe to the channel, like the video, give us a comment, subscribe if you're listening on Spotify, Google, Apple, or whatever platform we're on. We'd really appreciate your support. We'll be back again next week with another special guest. Thank you for listening to the Photographers Inside the Photographer's Mind. See ya.